lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and has set the rich away empty. And I look at this beautiful church filled with beautiful people and I wonder, what does this text say about us? Is it a warning? Does it say nothing at all? Is, is Luke writing solely to someone else? Or is there something else going on here? How can we here today find hope in a text that describes a new, turned upside down world order where God promises to upset our customary way of living and seeing the world? How should we hear this text? As a battle cry? With joy or fear, excitement or trepidation? Or to put it another way, for Christians in this land, how do the rich hear good news to the poor? This text very much forces me to check my privilege and try to come to terms with how much of today's reading I'll never understand. Thanks to hardworking parents, I really have never had to want for anything. I've eaten my share of ramen noodles, but I've never been poor. I've never been alone. I've never struggled with fertility issues. No one's ever harassed me, touched me inappropriately, or tried to look down my shirt. The only comment I ever receive on my clothing is from my wife, and that com comment is typically, oh, so you're wearing that. <laughs> no church I have ever served has ever said, Pastor, I mean, Bishop, please, whatever you do, don't send us a white male pastor. But if I were a woman, there would still be churches who would ask the bishop for anyone but me. No one's ever waved the Bible in my face in an attempt to dismiss my calling. No one's ever justified paying me less because of my gender. I am far less likely to develop an eating disorder to conform to our culture's photoshopped expectations. And I am even more unlikely to ever huddle with my children in a shelter next to a, next to a donated cell phone because I no longer feel safe in my home. So here I am. So here we are, faced with a rare reading from our gospel for all of the characters are women, and the one man who could, had he wanted to, been a part of the story was unable to speak because he died with an angel and displeased God. In another advent reading from Luke's gospel, the grown up John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling people for repentance, only to hear them ask, What are we to do? And it seems to me that that question stands before us today. As the Magnificat goes in our minds. In this morning's text, Mary is pregnant with the one who would grow up and speak of injustice and especially economic injustice throughout his ministry. Speaking of a new order where the first would be last and the last would be first. And so they killed him for it. Jesus, the one who would speak of selling all of our possessions and the rich entering heaven being like a camel passing through a needle's eye and salvation being treated being rooted in our treatment of the least of these. And for all of the talk of the modern church about heaven and hell or eight times human sexuality, Jesus speaks more frequently about money than all three of those things in mind. In many ways, Mary's song should prepare us for the coming of the Christ as much or more than the ministry of John the Baptist. This song, the Magnificat, whose name comes from the Latin for magnify, is a rebellious text. There can be no honest treatment of the scripture that ignores this fact. And throughout much of history, it has been challenged by the powerful and given hope to the meek. Jason Porterfield writes, during the British rule of India, the Magnificat was prohibited from being sung in church. In the 1980s, Guatemala's government discovered Mary's words about God's preferential love for the poor to be too dangerous and revolutionary. The song had been creating quite a stir among Guatemala's impoverished masses, and Mary's words were making the impoverished masses believe that change was actually possible, and thus the government banned any public recitation of words I read just a few moments ago. Similarly, when the mothers of the Plaza de Maya, whose children all disappeared during the Dirty War, placed the Magnificat's words on posters throughout the Capitol Plaza, and the military junta of Argentina outlawed any public display of Mary's song. Mary articulates an end to the economic structure that are exploited and unjust. She speaks of a time when all will enjoy the good things that are given by God. 
So we come to church today at the Fourth Advent Camp Boothler, expecting the typically serene and silent St. Mary, great with child, an introvert who speaks when spoken to and largely keeps to herself, seen but not heard. And we wonder what's going on in her heart and her thoughts. Yet when she launches into a song in our worship spaces here in the first world, we're likely to shift in our seats, clear our throats, close our eyes, and telepathically attempt to make her stop. The kingdom of God, with all its topsy turviness, does not wait until a 30 year old Jesus starts preaching and yowling to ring in our ears. It's on display right here and right now. In earth shaking words from a young woman who we have often been taught to believe that her role in the gospel story was simple to be faithful, trusting, and compliant. And yet, apparently, this ability to shape the world on its foundation runs in the family. And just like that, we're back in the wilderness with the crowd listening to John the Baptist saying, what are we to do? Archbishop Desmond Tutu was once speaking in a packed cathedral in apartheid era Cape Town, South Africa. And policemen came in and lined all of the outside walls of the church. And they had no pads. And they were waiting for him to say anything controversial or subversive. And Tutu looked out and he saw these men who were recording his words and he pointed his finger at them. And he said, you may be powerful, indeed very powerful, but you are not God. And the God whom we serve cannot be mocked. You have already lost. And then he smiled and said, and we are inviting you to come and join the winning side. We read those fiery Old Testament prophets who are sometimes harsh words of warning. He has told you, O oh Lord, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, as the prophet Michael wrote, or let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, as the prophet Amos proclaimed. We hear them. And today we hear Mary saying, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away. We hear them and we realize, do we not, how seldom our God conforms to our tidy expectations of a parochial, containable, transactional God who is there when needed and who largely stays out of the way. The Magnificat shakes us out of our dancing sugar plum slumber and prepares us for just how far our God is willing to go to remake this world in and through the person and work of a son born to a virgin and raised by a virgin and a carpenter's son in a tiny backwater town in far from home. And it's hope for the world and it's hope for us today. It's hope for the African woman who will walk miles today to fill a heavy jug with clean water to carry all the way back home. It's hope for communities where children die of preventable diseases due to a lack of education and medication. It's hope for the father in Haiti, foraging for food for his family. It's hope in the rural villages where it's commonly believed that it's always better to educate a boy than a girl. It's hope for the forced migrants seeking asylum from violence and warfare. It's hope in urban housing projects where the sound of your name or the color of your skin can determine your chances of finding work and the odds of you surviving a traffic stop. It is hope for those today who have to make that, that impossible choice between food and medicine. It's hope for the Appalachian miner waiting for assistance as he dies of black lung. And it's hope for all the freezing women and men standing on the medians in our intersections holding their signs and waiting. And it's hope for us. The Bible, and especially the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, and the narrative was the witness of the four Gospels revealed a radical God of justice, righteousness, and compassion. And in these ancient writings, who by the Spirit's power come to life anew for each generation of God's people, reveal to us what is truly important to God, and how this God will redeem, renew, and restore this world in the fullness of time. Therefore, Mary's revolutionary song is good news to us, because it enables us to know where to align our ourselves, our time, our talents, and our resources. 
It's good news because we don't have to rectify everything that's broken in this world alone as if God were not with us. It's good news because it demonstrates reasons for hope in the midst of seemingly hopeless situations. It's good news for us because God has provided us with ways in which we can partner with God and God's church and overthrow all that is wrong. Because of how God is, our God is trying to come to the way of a poor woman into a song of victory that is hope for the world and witness to all people. And in this song, God has said to you and to me and to us, I have told you, have I not, who will win this race before us? You know who the victor will be. So now, cast your nets. Come and join the way inside. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let's preserve and keep you now and ever. Amen.